3D printing for personalized treatment, heart tissues in focus is the topic of that masterclass and welcome on stage uh, Dennis Bohm. He is member of the management board Invent Medical Group and uh, he's uh, coming um, because his colleague is uh, getting sick yesterday and so welcome on stage and thank you very much for jumping in that uh, new uh, topic for you but uh, you're on the field so uh, I think you will manage that. Thank you and a warm welcome to Dennis. Samples, um, so that you can have a look already when I'm talking about it. Uh, that you know what products we are able to deliver to our customers. Um, yeah, my name is Dennis. Um, I'm from Germany and responsible for a German-speaking market. Um, what I want to talk about today is uh, 3D printing about uh, or an A phone SMOs. Uh, I want to talk about the benefits, the challenges, and uh, showing you a patient case. No? Doesn't it work? Ah. Okay. Um, who we are? We are an experienced digital uh, manufacturer for OMP. Um, we have three offices. Uh, it's in Czech Republic. Czech Republic is the main office. Um, we have eight manufacturing sites on three continents, and we serve B2B customers in 40 countries. Now we are in more. 40 than 40 countries. We are a company from uh, Czech Republic. Uh, we have experience with more than 30 years experience in OMP field. Uh, so we have also an OMP clinic, which was um, already available before we opened Invent Medical. Uh, we have 12 years experience in 3D printing um, in the OMP field, so um, we used all technologies which are responsible for OMP. Um, yes. We are a team with um, more than 75 people. Uh, the most inside the team are clinical part um, for our patients um, and the uh, smallest part of it is in the medical which is mainly based on um, on development product development and software development we also have different types of products um, we have our eight soul so is our insole, it's all 3D printed here, what we see. Uh, we have the pyros, pyro are our AFOs and SMOs. We have Argo socket, it's a TT socket, uh, also fully, totally, yeah, it's uh, 3D printed. We have our main product, which is maybe one of the uh, most known products from Invent Medical, it's a tally, tally cranial remolding autosis, it's for kids. Um, for our babies uh, up to 14 or 15 months um, and it's made for cranial remolding. We have Teleprotect and also Tele post op version. So what are the benefits in OMP field um, of 3D printing? We have um, that design freedom uh, which is able to give us completely new uh, designs which we are not able to do in traditional manufacturing. Uh, what was impossible f before is now possible. And we can see it also in the design. Um, whoever has already seen a traditional product knows now when he sees the products on the screens or here um, physically that uh, there's a huge benefit of it. It adds value and uh, breaks also the limitations of traditional fabrication. The process at Inver Medical, we, are, um, we take care that the process of digital manufacturing and also a des design process is uh, really easy. Um, otherwise, we will not be able to reach our technicians and um, because Creating a really good product is a really difficult, um, a difficult process. Um, so we take care about the products and an easy guideline behind it. So we have an online configuration that our technicians can uh, access to it from all over the world. Um, what we need for a process is a 3D scan or 
maybe a 3D CAD file, um, not of the product itself, um, just of the positive. So if we speak from about positive, it's a limp, it's a arm, hat, whatever. In the background, we have an algorithm. Um, the algorithm is designing our products, which we created and uh, tested in our labs, which is also CE certified. Um, so there's, a, I would say, close to a fully automated process um, to create those products. And after some um, human, um, yeah, human controlling, we give it to the 3D printing process. Which scanning can we do? Uh, you can use an iPhone, you can use a structure sensor, you can use white light, white light scanners. It's all having benefits, so it's uh, having pros and cons. Um, what we prefer is white light scanners because white light scanners are able to deliver the highest precision uh, in own P-field. Um, it's not uh, possible to get those data with the iPhone or structure sensor. It's having, as I said, pros and cons. We do it on that way, on our online um, configuration process that we want to make it easy. So we have different groups of indications. We have that low tone pronation, high tone pronation, supination, toe walking, knee hyperextension, um, crouching, and non-ambulatory. Beho behind all the groups are different types of orthosis already uh, pre-selected so that it's easy for the technician or the clinician um, to find out which product is uh, uh, possible to serve to the customer. Pyro benefits or benefits of 3D printing also uh, is that we can make it light of the feather. So it's a uh, um, the weight of it is reduced by up to 70 percent in, in comparison to uh, standard autosis. Uh, so we make it really thin, um, breathable, um, so that patients can wear traditional clothes, not uh, special um, orthopedic shoes, for example, so that they look like people. Uh, who you, who me are, so we don't wear that special um, products. Benefits, as you can see on the samples here, um, which I've given you, uh, are also that we can um, optimize products. So we can do um, combinations of two different materials. Here we have a uh, pyrofusion. It's a combination of polyamide and TPU. So we can have that stiffness to um, support uh, joints and we can also have with TPU the flexible parts to make it breathable and also flexible and soft um, so that we have that uh, also that soft brims on the orthosis to make it more comfortable, especially on bony areas. Also what we can do here in uh, 3D printing is that we can pre-select uh, material stiffnesses um, that we give in this example for our configurator um, kits to our uh, customers where they can pre-select the thickness or the softness of a forefoot um, flexibility. And our con algorithm is um, recalculating the flexibility of the sample to the patient's needs, so weight, f um, activity grade, foot length, and so on. We have different types for SMOs. It's a pyroflex, the pyrofusion, fusion X, and active. Um, it's uh, in a row of um, dynamic to more uh, stability. And also here we have different types for AFOs, which is uh, made for uh, dynamic, pyrodynamic. It's uh, an AFO with joints. Here we see it with a pivot joint. We can also make it with um, tamarack joints. Then we have the control, the block, the rehab and the static. Also here from activity or dynamic to more static products. Here is uh, just uh, some feedback from a customer uh, who told us uh, that the new product, which is a uh, Pyroflex, it's a, a, a replacement, I would say, for a cascade autosis, whoever 
nose here. Um, it's uh, supporting the ankle joint for kids up to five years and gives them a lot of flexibility in walking. So it's not stiff, it's flexible because it's made full out of TPU. Um, we also take care about the quality. So before a product will be developed, we have uh, more than 500 iterations in product development. Um, the product is developed in around five years. And we also take care about the material and different technology. So there is not just one technology for everything. There is different type of technology for our needs. Um, we do mechanical tests inside our development part, and um, we do the computational analysis to take care that we can give a guarantee to a technician, to a clinician, um, that the product works and that will not crack and um, do some negative to the patient. All the tests will also be done in first step in our own clinic so that we know what a patient needs, how can we optimize it, and what is uh, a good option for the full market. Here is a step, it's a verification. Um, that's the last step in our process. So we take also care by a human, not by an algorithm, um, that we approve the incoming data, the outcoming data, and also the algorithm data so that when we give it to a print, that the product is that what you want to get. So thank you much. Um, our mission, Hopping Through Innovation, hopefully you will be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now stay here, please, ah. just a moment. Um, thank you so much, especially for jumping in for your colleague. Uh, therefore, you got one minute more. Yeah. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, of course, we will have a discussion, and uh, but uh, firstly, we will have another speech. So please have a seat, Thank and uh, uh, I'll come to you back later. You, you know, you can ask your question on Slido, so uh, feel free to do that. But firstly, I uh, would like to introduce our next speakers. Two of them. Uh, welcome to Celine Austerheim Kreftling. She is chief engineer, and uh, Stefan Hunstock, who's medical doctor. Uh, and they're coming from Norway and telling us uh, how Oslo University Hospital is delivering the 3D printing for improved orthopedical patient uh, care. And the floor is yours. Thank you for coming. So I'm Celine, and this is Stefan. Um, so we will today uh, present to you how we our development process at our 3D uh, center, uh, as well as a short introduction to the importance of medicine, um, 3D printing in medicine, and also in-house. And we will uh, show you a few of our patient cases. So we are situated at Oslo University Hospital, which is in the capital of Norway. Uh, our 3D print center isn't as large as uh, any others. Uh, it's just the two of us. <laughs> uh, so Stefan started with 3D printing back in 2015 with the company Materialize. And uh, I did my master thesis within uh, 3D bioprinting. So we started out on two quite different uh, specters of the, of the medical AM technology. But together, we have decided to focus on uh, plastic, um, uh, plastic models, uh, surgical and educational ones. Uh, and uh, so we mainly print with the PLA and uh, PVA. Uh, it's uh, simple, easy, um, cheap, and it fulfills uh, all the needs of our surgeons. We also do some surgical guides that we print uh, with the dental biocompatible material. So our development process, uh, we started back in uh, 2020. Uh, the orthopedic department at our hospital decided to uh, support our project by uh, buying an Ultimaker S5 printer, the same that we use almost every day today. 
Um, I also got a position within this project, uh, which has gained from 40% to a full-time position today. Uh, and this year, Stefan also got a 20% uh, um, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what is it? position, position. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, within the project. We also received some grant money in order to buy a Forum Labs 3D Plus. Uh, so, just a short overview of this year. Uh, we have, uh, as I assume many others have, uh, focused a lot of uh, creating an adequate uh, QMS system, as well as working with our regular patient cases. We also had uh, an intern and been able to do some talks and uh, other stuff besides our research cases. Uh, so, well, uh, a lot of you here know the great importance of uh, AM. Um, as I said, we only use plastic, but we have seen great advantages of that. Um, a lot of our surgeons use, um, uh, use our models in order to show the patients or the next of kin, uh, to tell them more about their diseases or the surgeries or even the outcomes of the surgeries. We can also test uh, test uh, the procedures beforehand by uh, actually doing surgery on the models. Research also show that uh, uh, that we use less radiation and there's less blood loss if we use uh, the 3D models, as well as it increases uh, surgical precision. We have in some cases also used our models in order to educate new medical doctors. Even though I have a full-time uh, position, we save a lot of money, uh, especially in the OR. Um, and uh, we can create a lot of more patient cases when we have, uh, have um, this in-house uh, instead of uh, buying external models. It's also faster to have uh, an engineer in-house and safer. Uh, since, I am an, um, since I am employed at the hospital, I can download the images safely and also receive all the patient information uh, very safely. So all of this is just uh, gaining a lot of competence in-house, uh, which is very advantageous for us. It's hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I'm on the user side. Um, it's so great to present, uh, well, when I prepared this talk, I thought how to present what I'm doing to a lot of people who are extremely interested in the technical part of it. Uh, and I want to give you my perspective on the surgical side, how I see the benefits of AM technology in my work. And I thought I would like to demonstrate the strength and the enormous power behind 3D printing and what it does to surgeons uh, with this very simple case. It's a case of a 20-year-old female with a uh, rigid and painful flat foot, and flat feet, they're extremely common. So this is a, we are not talking about colibris, we're talking about an extremely common um, condition. And she has a coalition between the talus and the calcaneus, forcing the calcaneus into a valgus position and giving her lateral impingement uh, over the perineus tendon. So and we thought about how to solve it. Of course, we could operate it as we always do by thump, the rule of thump. But we thought, no, we want to increase our precision to it. So what we did, we 3D printed her uh, CT and we took a weight-bearing CT just to really depict the real, um, the, the real deformity while standing. And the tricky part of it is when you see a patient, you cannot see really the skeleton. It's really nicely into a, a, a fat pad, a heel padding, and it's not so easy to take actually the bony deformity to it. And if you think you cannot really see it in the, in the, in the, in the outpatient clinic, think how hard it's going to see in the operating room. How much should I correct the calcaneus into without opening up the whole calcaneus, and that's what we definitely don't want to do. 
So Selena helped me with that case, and we did a, a 3D planning, and we would like to take a wedge out in between the calcaneus and talus just to move the calcaneus just below the tibia into the right axis. And I think, well, m maybe I'm just a mediocre surgeon, but this is extremely hard to do in the OR, to get the exact placement. So, and this is how we planned. So on the right side is the preoperative side, on the left side, the postoperative side. And for doing that, and after the planning, uh, we, we created a guide, and we took also the models into surgery, just to exactly uh, point out where to go to and where to place the guides. And then here we put the guides, and these guides, they give me the exact direction of how to, where to take out the wedge and how the wedge should look like in order to get a perfect alignment. And then we fix up the screw. This is very orthopedic surgery stuff. And this would be the outcome. So you can see her deformity prior and postoperatively. And this is her outcome uh, four months after surgery without having any pain and walking again. And I know this is a super simple case, but I think I would not be able to do an exact correction of this deformity if I wouldn't have planned it in the way I did. So other strength to, to it is that we can develop totally new surgery techniques. This is a case of a 12-year-old girl. She got a fracture and she uh, got a bony bridge in her growth plate, meaning this growth plate is going to stop giving her growth. And there have been described ordinary techniques in order to remove those bony bridges and bring growth back again, but to an extremely high failure rate and a very extensive type of surgery if you look at those pictures. So what we did is that we segmented this case and we, we, we could detect exactly the bony bridge in the growth plate. And then we would, by 3D planning, uh, uh, create a guide how to remove exactly this portion without hurting the rest, the residual growth plate. And that's what it looked like, so we just drilled it away. And to the left side, you can see six months after, and she regained growth in the growth plate. And we have now a manuscript going on where we have four cases with two years of follow-up showing that all of the four patients regained growth. Another thing which I think is, is, is a strong argument for using 3D print is surgeons can actually train on complex cases prior surgery. And I know this is very scary to think of, but nowadays you train while doing. But now we can train prior. We can test different ideas, we can test different implants, we can test different strategies to it. And here's another interesting case where we hope the video works. No, it doesn't. Okay, let's retry. Here we go. Now it's video coming. So you can actually simulate what you're thinking about doing to the patient within the next six months, because this is a patient in a frame for this long period. And it's going to, you can see how the bone is going to move, and you can also detect is there any problems with soft tissue. So this has never been uh, possible before. So, I think that this is an extremely great uh, a technique. We, this is not only my opinion. The surgeons at the hospital would fully agree that this gives a, a, a very unique uh, insight into the planning, and it changes planning of surgery. And with that, I would really like to thank you for your attention. Thank you both for your impressive insight in your work and have a seat. We have a lot of questions we are going to answer now. Maybe you can right, of course. the next one. Thank you so much. Of course. Thank you. Well, let's start with the first question to, to Dennis. How do you thought, have you thought of using the otases for patients with fractures as well as an alternative for casts? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we uh, have some plans and uh, we have some ideas in development, um, so I cannot talk about it too much, um, <laughs> but 
Yeah, it's also a case uh, which we already got information from customers. Oh, that's work in progress. Uh, it's something progress, I would say, yeah. Uh -huh. Interesting, interesting. And adding another question, how do you tackle certification and approval? How we do it? We yeah. have an um, in-house lab for it. Also, we work together with a university, which is from uh, Bruno mm -hmm. in Czech Republic. Um, and we uh, have one of our colleagues which uh, was trained by them. So for next year or next two years, we build up a really huge lab for it so that we can do it all inside our company. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Moving over to Celine. What is your experience with building up a 3D lab? It's a very global question, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe you can ask some sp uh, add some specific uh, uh, aspects. It's been a long process, uh, but we've had great support from the orthopedic department. Uh, our main goal is to build up so that all the departments in the hospital would like to join. Um, but we have, uh, I mean, it's been difficult and fun. <laughs> and we're very happy with where we are today. And, uh, and are you accepted as an engineer in that field, in that area? Yes, the, the orthopedic surgeons really like it. They are grateful <laughs> that you are there. <laughs> and it's really fun to see how they also want to always push the limits and try new things, um, especially with having an in-house engineer. They can just knock on my door and yeah, ask yeah. questions. Yeah. And uh, what are the current challenges in your work with heart tissues? I think that's another question for you, Dennis. <sighs> How to say, um, current challenges. Um, maybe I need a different... Uh, everything works fine. Everything works fine, <laughs> yeah, sure. No, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work fine, everything. So we need all of that uh, iterations, yeah. and uh, we still had a lot of problems uh, from the beginning. Yeah. Um, but uh, the most problems are solved, uh, so we are still in a good way to make it easy for the next developments and also yeah. for new products. Yeah, well, what you told us, uh, one of the challenges might have been uh, uh, to, to get it more lightweighted. Yeah, yeah. We, we definitely make it more lightweighted, breathable. Um, we, give, we get to a different, um, um, what is it? Uh, let me say, I, I missed the word for it. Um, Say in German, it's no problem. Most of people um, understand. Indication, German. indications, yeah. Indication. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we're still in progress, yeah. and we yeah. give it to more and more patients, and give it to more and more different types of your body. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. Yeah, maybe that's a question for you, Stefan. How do you validate your anatomical models printed at hospital being a medical, medical device? Well, um, I might answer this question, including the next question, how the process is going from CT to 3D. Uh, Go ahead. Because we have uh, uh, now a quality management system. We uh, first do segmentation, then the surgeons are, are uh, ensuring the quality of segmentation. So it's always a, a combined process by surgeons and Celine as an engineer. It must be qualified uh, by, an, by an expert. Is, is this a, a right segmentation of the right part we're actually looking at. And then when the, the model is printed, well, then it's the question, what are you kind of using the model for? So if you're using the model for just to get an impression of, of the anatomy, mm -hmm. not using it for, for any uh, guide, um, uh, creation of guides, so th then the validation process ends there because we have the CT, we have the 3D uh, pictures of the CT, and we can we can see, okay, this looks as the same. So, but uh, the, the validation process has to go further, of course, when we are then using the models for molding or creating guides, because then we have to really ensure that, uh, and then we have another round with uh, radiologists to, uh, to help us to let the segmentation process Find the right work. place inside. Yes, and also to, to, sh to make sure that the segmentation is done properly and p perfectly. Yeah. So this is uh, the way how we have this, the, that we pitch back and forth mm -hmm. with uh, the engineer, orthopedic surgeon, and yeah. the radiologist in order just to make sure that we uh, yeah. made the segmentation right. You watch on it from every side, yeah. Yeah. Would you like to add something, Celine? Um, I think it's... 
Okay. Well done. <laughs> we also are um, uh, we are also talking a lot with other Norwegian hospitals. We have uh, quarterly meetings in order to have sort of the same process and see that we all do the same because I do think a lot of people here as well find find it very difficult to understand the MDRs. And the yeah. May I add another question? Uh, which regulatory implications do you have to consider for the surgical guides? Well, we can both uh, can answer that. Um, well, uh, Norway is not part of EU. However, the MDRs are still are still um, um, they, they have been adapted by the Norwegian health governments. And now this year in January, we got their interpretation and modified version, which is actually one to one to the MDRs in Europe. So what we have done, of course, uh, we are we are working on the QMS process. We have been working for one and a half years. Uh, uh, and we're working closely together with Aarhus uh, and Karolinska Institute so that we have a, a common sense to how to inter interpret the QMS system. And well, and then we ask the authorities, yeah, mm -hmm. what do you think about that? And the authorities, yeah, we don't know. Uh, <laughs> and, and then we said, yeah, what to do about that? Well, we don't know. <laughs> can you propose something? So, yeah, we can propose something. So, uh -huh. well, as we all know, this is a growing field, and I also <laughs> think, to some to some extent, the authorities are unsure how to really put it in place. And this is a. And now, now we started um, a work with the Norwegian Lege uh, Middelverke, which is uh, the authority uh, kind of implementing the MDRs in order to to find a, a good way how a QMS system should look like. Mm -hmm. So we are aligning with authorities. I don't know if this is smart or not, but we can <laughs> tell you later. But also our surgical guys are the only ones that we, or we design them at the hospital, but yeah. we print them externally yep. uh, so that we know that they do all of the uh, testing and everything. So when yep. we get them, then they're... That's a good point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And there's another question. What is maybe it leads to that? What is a QMS process like while setting up this 3D lab and printing surgical guides? Uh, is there any? Is this what you told us, or is there anything to add? I, I think it's yeah. pretty much what we're talking okay. about. Okay, okay. And uh, there is a question. What is the cost for a materialized license? Is that a question for you, or no? It's for no, us. For, it's for you. It's for, it's for us. Because I <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's very costly, uh, and it depends on what kind of modules you, you're choosing. This is a materialized system. is a module-based system, uh, starting from a module for segmentation, a module for uh, creating guides, uh, a model for so depending on what kind of modules you're using, uh, the costs are going up. But I would say it's, um, it, well, it's very costly. Uh, it's 15,000 euros, what we are using per day. On the other hand, if you think that one screw costs 500 euro, and when I do a scoliosis surgery, I use 24 screws and two rods, making an implant from 25,000 euros. So I think it's half a scoliosis implant, so that's quite cheap. <laughs> Okay. No, it's just a joke. It's quite expensive, but <laughs> we're using it. <laughs> well, we are looking at other options as well, but that's the one yeah. we find the yeah. most. Uh, yeah. are you, do you think that this will reduce during the next year, within the next years? No, no. We, we, it, it definitely is not going to reduce. Uh, only some, the only, there's nothing is reducing in the world <laughs> in price right now. So that's the cost. The cost will increase actually. However, so w when we did an analysis to it, when we, because when we were creating this, the 3D lab, we had to convince my boss that this is a good idea. <laughs> and the only way to convince the boss is that the money talks. So we have a cutoff of 15 cases, what we do in-house, yeah. and then we are even, and all what we do beyond 15 cases, this is in plus. And last, last 12 months, we are, uh, uh, had 3D print support for 42 cases. So I think plus for two, research. yeah. Hmm? Plus research. Yeah, plus research. <laughs> but anyway, so so it it really, um, I, I think it's a it's a it's beneficial for for a big department to have it in house. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Our time is over. Uh, if there are s still uh, questions left, I think you can d discuss it uh, during the next breaks uh, with the. O auditorium and thank you so much for answering all that questions and especially for you to jumping in.
Thanks. Frozen. Thank you.